Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 393, uh, featuring the third installment of my interview with the great Chuck Somerville. In this part of the interview, we talk about his most famous game, Chips Challenge, and all of the drama around this game. The dramas around the Atari Lynx, uh, the Microsoft, basically screwed the guy. It's just uh, really, uh, you're just going to be shocked uh, to hear what Chuck has to say about that. Uh, we also talk about Chips Challenge 2 and all the dramas around that. And uh, finally, uh, with this whole Ben 10 thing and uh, where the game ended up and why Chuck still hasn't made a dime uh, from this incredible game that uh, for a lot of people is right up there with like Solitaire and Tetris and, you know, just <laughs> you know basic uh, games that they really love. Uh, anyway, uh, there's a lot to cover here, so without further ado, here is Chuck Somerville. Long interview, huh? <laughs> no, no, that's fine. Well, it'd be a total bummer. <laughs> Not to talk about uh, Chips Challenge. So let, let's get into this one because I think you, would you say it's just probably your best known game, Chips Challenge? Boy, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, everybody's played um, this. Yeah, Chips Challenge is a great game. Um, so, so Chips Challenge. So the history behind Chips Challenge, the original version, the one that I wrote, was for the Atari Lynx. And it was How written in 65. Maybe, maybe before we get into the chips, I, I just I've never heard anybody really talk about the Lynx on this show. Okay. You know, I mean, it's, to me that was a really incredible handheld gaming platform. I don't know why it just seemed like it just kind of failed, I guess, in the uh, the marketplace. It was, but I was really. It, uh, okay, so it was the first handheld color game system, and you know, before the Game Boy Color, it was the first. And it was also the first one to have a dedicated um, pixel engine. So it had a, hard, a hardware blitter that could blit um, trying or well rectangles um, into memory. So from a hardware point of view, it was really great. Um, I loved working on it because you know it had had uh, we could draw a lot of stuff on the screen and you know with with less code. Um, you know, and that's why we were able to do things like um, the the flight simulator game, um, light, uh, Blue Lightning, I believe it was called. Um, but some people claim that it was the downfall of Epix because so much money was thrown into it. Uh, we eventually ran out of money on that project, and we had to sell it off to somebody else. And that's when Atari, I mean, it was grown at Epix. So Atari bought it, and then they basically didn't push it hard enough, in, in my opinion. I mean, because the technology was there, if they had if they had actually put more money into the marketing, then I think it would have taken off. Was it a did it have something to do with the Amiga hardware? You know, I've heard <clears throat> that it something had some connection um, to the. There is a connection to the Amiga hardware. So the team that built it, um, the hardware and um, you know main manager of the project was R. J. Michael and Dave Needle. And they were also the team that brought this, the Amiga. So um, they were brought into Epix to help mastermind this handheld game system. And I think they did a great job. And that's where I got to meet R.J. Michael, one of my best friends. Mm -hmm. uh, the poor Lynx. But anyway, <laughs> I guess, uh, people that had the Lynx, they got to play Chip's Challenge. Or the, they were the, must have been the first players of the game, right? And then it uh, eventually yeah. made it onto these other systems. So... Um, the, the story behind how Chip Challenge came about yeah. was kind of interesting. And uh, so I was working on a tank game uh, a that tank was going to draw a tank game yeah. that was going to draw polygons for walls and pylons and things like that. And um, I, I basically was spinning my wheels and I wasn't making good progress on it. And they decided to cancel the project. But there was still going to be um, about another 10 weeks left until we were ready to, you know, go final with all the current titles. And I didn't have a project to work on. So I said, I want to do this game, you know. And up to that point at Epics, every game that I had written had been a game that somebody had told me, you're going to work on this game, right? You know, so I hadn't actually designed anything up to that point. And I said, I want to do this game. I got this idea. 
I want to do a map a map based puzzle action game. And um, so I spent a couple weeks and I made a prototype in low res on the Apple II and I shut it off and they said, okay. So I had 10 weeks. So ten the game weeks. was written, in, uh, yeah, the game was written in 10 weeks. <clears throat> um, but there were all these other projects for the links that were finishing up. So there were programmers that were, you know, coming off their tasks and there were testers that were available. So I had an army of people behind me. Um, so it wasn't just me. I, I was just, I just wrote code and designed some levels. Um, but, uh, I mean, the, the concept, the game design, the game elements, um, everything, that was me. And, uh, and I had a lot of help from other level designers and testers. If you look at the credit, there's a lot of level designers and there's a lot of testers. You came up with a story about the kid and the, I was at the mental Marvel. He's trying Actually, to I don't think I wrote that. I don't yeah. think I wrote the story. Um, I, you know, I, I made a story engine that a story could be put into and uh, I'm not sure who wrote the story. Hmm. It wasn't but, you going, uh, like, bummer, bummer? <laughs> uh, no, actually, the bummer wasn't in the Lynx version. Oh, that was the... I must, um, be, I must be thinking of the later version. Uh, yeah, so what happened with the, the Microsoft version was um, somebody, unbeknownst to me, uh, got in touch with Microsoft, or Microsoft got in touch with, with them, and they wanted to make a version for Microsoft's Entertainment Pack. So... Um, so Microsoft wrote the Microsoft version. It was not done in house. Oh, wow! So you didn't even and know about this. I didn't even know what was going on. And when it came out, I was actually pissed um, because when I saw it, why the heck didn't they get in touch with you about this? This seems like a crappy thing. Um, well, you know, it's it's interesting. Uh, uh, a good friend of mine, um, Tony Garcia, who last time I checked was the head of business develop at U development at Unity. Uh, <laughs> Tony Garcia was um, started out. Um, I mentioned Tony Garcia. He started out working on the assembly line at Sirius, working with the shrink wrap machines. And then uh, when they went, when they folded, he he left the game industry. And I urged him to come back in to work at Epix. Um, so he came and uh, worked. I think he started out as a tester, but he went, ended up in the marketing department. And he did great in the marketing department. And then when Epix folded, or, no, I guess he had left by then. Yeah, so he, he left, and I guess he went to Mark, Microsoft. But he was working in their fledgling game development um, team at Microsoft. And it was his love of Chip's Challenge there at Microsoft that, you know, brought about that connection. Um so anyway, I thought Microsoft did a really bad job of it. They may have been constrained by how good the hardware was at the time because they didn't have a blitting engine or anything like that. So the Microsoft version, um, as you play it, your character jumps from square to square. It doesn't, um, it doesn't sp sp uh, scroll smoothly. And the Lynx version scrolls smoothly. And to me, that was very important. I, I liked the fluidity of the game. So I never really liked that. Um, and it's there's... Kind of a you know a, a platform war now in the chips challenge community between whether or not you like the Microsoft jumpy version oh, or whether wow. you like the smooth scrolling version. <laughs> that um, because um, eventually I was able to do chips challenge too. Um, I should probably mention that right now. Uh, we'll talk. Yeah, let me talk about chips challenge too. So. Um, after I left Epics, I went to EA and then to 3DO. And when I left 3DO, I finally decided I was going to do this game, a sequel to Chips Challenge, which I couldn't do as I was working for other publishers. Um, I was going to do a sequel to Chips Challenge because the fans kept sending me emails and stuff saying, hey, we want a sequel. So um, I contacted the people who owned the name Chips Challenge uh, at the time. And uh, they said, "Sure, go ahead. You know, Is we'll, we'll help bridge, you." Bridgestone. Is that the Bridgestone? Yeah. They said, "We'll we'll we'll help you with that. You know, when you get it done." So I spent two years. I didn't contact them for two years. Spent two years wrote the game, and um, then I went back to them and said, uh, "Yeah, so um, we want you to give us three hundred thousand dollars." And um, we want guaranteed sales of this amount for the first two years, you know, like they don't understand the game industry. 
they're because still kind they're, of Christian publisher, right? Yeah, they, they they make their living selling Christian videos, and they ended up with the rights because they bought it wholesale with all the other titles because they wanted this game called Bible Builder that was a very late Epics title. Bible Builder. Um, yeah. <laughs> And so then they got Chip's Challenge, I guess, was part well, of Well, because they got the, the whole catalog. Yeah, the whole, yeah, the lot, I think. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so anyway, um, I, there's no way, I mean, I can't afford $300,000 to give these guys, you know, and I can't guarantee any sales. So, I, you know, it was dead as far as I was concerned. And I was really depressed about it for a couple of years. Um, and then... Um, the game was finished. I, I mean, yeah, the game was finished. I, the game was finished. So they and just told I had, you three hundred thousand. They wouldn't negotiate or anything with you. Or? Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. so anyway, um, I had I had beta testers out there um, that had helped me during the development and doing doing the level design, and I had them all under signed contract, and they all had serialized copies of the game, so that if anyone leaked it, I would know where it came from. So, they were. They were really, really good about not leaking in the game. It never got, it was never released. I mean, not even to the Pirate Network. So these were really great guys. But they're hardcore Chips fans, you know, and, and they're supportive of my work. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, they were, you know, they were so honest about it. Um, but anyway, um, probably about, I don't know, 10 or 15 years later, Actually, every now and then somebody would contact me and they would say, I want to put Chip's Challenge on such and such a platform. And I would say, yeah, good luck. Call these guys. See what you can find out. <laughs> <laughs> and they all ran into the same brick wall. So finally, uh, this one guy contacted me, uh, Barn Cleave, and he said, I want to put Chip's Challenge on the iPhone. And I said, yeah, good luck with that. You know, uh, I, I, I'll be willing to help you if you can get the rights. I see the so same guys up, the whole time. Jeez. And this was this was a different guy. This oh. this this Barn Cleave a different guy. So I mean the, the Bridgestone people. Yeah, same same yeah, Bridgestone, same guys. And um so Barn, you know, he went he went through uh Bridgestone and found out, you know, how, how absurd their um demands were. And he came back and he said, you know, maybe we can do something else. Maybe we can make a game like Chips Challenge, um, but not call it Chips Challenge. So he said, how about we call it Chuck's Challenge? That was not my idea. That was not my idea. Yeah, but you approved, obviously. And I said, okay, we'll do that. And it says, and in the description of the game, we'll put from the creator of Chip's Challenge, which is legal to put in the description, right? So when people do their searches online for Chip's Challenge for the iPhone, it shows up because it's in the text. <laughs> and... Uh, so um, I said, look, I got a full-time job making stuff out of LEDs. I don't have time to write this. And they said, no problem. We'll hire a studio to do the code for you. Uh, you do the design. We'll give you some fancy title like executive designer or something like that. And uh, you just write off, you know, you, you help with it. And I said, okay, we'll do it. So, um, you know, a year or so later, we finally finished the product and got it out there. That was Chuck's challenge. Chuck's challenge um, continued to evolve and expand into other things. Like there was a, there were additional level packs, and then there I think there was a Chuck's challenge 3D, mm -hmm. and then we licensed the Ben 10 cartoon series. I the same uh, the Ben 10 game generator. I think it. Hold on a second, Chuck. It's kind of bad there for a second. What was okay. that about a cartoon? Oh. Yeah, so we uh, we licensed the the Niffler is named the company that we're doing this with um, Barnes Company and my company because I'm a co-founder of it. So um, we licensed the Ben Ten uh, game uh, cartoon series, uh, the the international license. We never could get the U.S. license on it, and we released a version of uh, Chuck's Challenge, the Chuck's Challenge engine skin for Ben Ten. So I think between um, ben, the Ben 10 users and the Chuck's Challenge users, I don't know, there were like five or six, five or six million registered users of that game. Wow. So it, it did pretty good um, saturation. Unfortunately, all the money we ever made from any of that stuff um, ended up going back to the studio, um, almost all of it. So as yet, Barn and I have not made any money at all off of Chuck's what? Challenge. It's true. It's really sad. Uh, all my work has been volunteer and nonprofit. 
Um, and you're not the first person to learn this. <laughs> I've said it in many interviews. That's not right. Um, it's not good. Um, but getting back to Chips Challenge 2, um, so about every year, Barn would contact Bridgestone again and say, hey, you know, we want to bring out Chips Challenge 2. It's all finished, and you're not making any money off of the Chips Challenge license. So after five years of uh, beating on their door, they finally agreed to a rev share uh, contract, which I can't give the numbers on, but let's just say it was very generous to Bridgestone. Um, and we still haven't made any money off of Chips Challenge. But, <laughs> um, but Chips Challenge is you can now actually buy Chips Challenge written by me that runs on the PC on the, through Steam. And we were able to release Chips Challenge 2, which people considered for years as this mystical creature. <laughs> That's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. I know it's been a while. Uh, and I don't know if I'll be able to keep up a firm uh, weekly schedule or not. We are going into the uh, new semester next week, so we'll see how it goes. Uh, hopefully I'll be able to put another one of these out. I probably want to do one more with Chuck, and then we'll get into, uh, I actually have two interviews in the can, uh, one with Thomas of Thy Sword, uh, Thomas Feinholm, and uh, one with uh, Leonard Bayarski, uh, who everybody knows who that is. Uh, so anyway, a lot of great stuff in the pipe, so stay tuned. As always, I want to thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you guys. Thank you, sincerely, and from the very bottom of my heart for keeping this show in production. Uh, remember, there's no uh, sponsors, no ads, uh, nothing like that. It's just guys like you uh, that step forward and say, "Hey, I like I like Matt. I like what he's doing here. I want to I want him to keep doing these shows, keep doing these interviews." So, uh, when he asks for one buck a show, uh, you know I'm fine with that. <laughs> it just takes a few seconds. Go over to Patreon if you like. And they've actually fixed the little problem they had with the uh, there for a while. They were. Uh, uh, and I don't want to get into it, but they were trying to do some uh, different kinds of pricing. Didn't really uh, work out very well. But anyway, they're back now uh, with the Buck a Show where that works out great. So uh, please take a minute to do that. Of course, if you want to put in more than a Buck a Show, they <laughs> that's really cool too. Uh, but even if you just tell people about the show, you know, share the links, uh, post it on Twitter, uh, whatever it is, your, your favorite forums that you're part of, uh, whatever it is, I really, really appreciate it. Uh, believe me, and once I just want to thank you uh, so much for that. It really means a lot to me, uh, so thanks. All right, what about that news from the Matt Cave? I got a lot of great news here for you. So first up is from Stig. Uh, GOG, good old games, is releasing some legend classics. And they're, they've uh, got one of them up already called Deathgate. Now, I'm not really familiar with this game. I hadn't heard of it before until uh, Stig pointed it out. But it came out in 1994, and it's a fantasy puzzle adventure. And if you look at the reviews there, apparently a lot of people, this is a, a game they were looking for for quite a while. It's a... Uh, basically a classic, and I think if you give it a chance, <laughs> you know, you'll get sucked in. Uh, you look at some of the hours these guys have clocked up on this thing. Anyway, it's only $5.99, and only the first entry in this uh, legend acquisition, as far as I can tell. So uh, definitely go check that out. And then uh, Shane Anstig uh, talked about this, this whole gaming disorder is an actual disease now, according to the World Health Organization. Uh, they uh, talking about gaming disorders that can include impaired control over gaming. In other words, you're gaming when you shouldn't be gaming. Uh, increased priority given to gaming uh, that it takes precedence over other life interests and daily activities. In other words, you're like, uh, should I play a video game or go have uh, relations <laughs> with your significant other? You know, if you're thinking you'd rather play the game, uh, I guess you might have this disorder. Uh, and I guess the rest of this stuff basically has to do with the work. You know, this seems like the same kind of stuff they've trotted out before. I don't really know what's so newsworthy about this idea. 
you know, are they getting government subsidies or checks from the, the government uh, because you have a gaming disorder? Uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know if it's come to that or not. Uh, I kind of I kind of think this is silly, to be honest with you. I don't know what your take is, though. I'd love to hear it. Uh, but anyway, go check this stuff out about the uh, World Health Organization and the gaming disorder. Let me know your thoughts on it. Love to love to hear that. And then uh, finally, this is uh, something from Shane Plays. Uh, Shane Stacks, good friend of the show, personal friend of mine. Uh, he's doing. Uh, I mean, I'll just read you what he what he wrote here, so I don't mess it up. So the upcoming CRPG from Owl Cat Games, based on the Pathfinder tabletop role playing game system, has now entered the alpha phase. Uh, Shane Stacks and some others are doing Let's Plays. Have been or well, they've been invited to do uh, test and sharing videos. Test and share their videos. <laughs> uh, that uh, man, I think Shane narrated this thing to his uh, his uh, iPhone, so it's it's a little jumbled. Uh, but anyway, uh, they're testing out this new game uh, that Chris Avalon is involved in. Chris is doing a lot of the writing on this. Uh, it says uh, you're handling a lot of the writing duties on the game, uh, but it's also been uh, adapted from some of the existing adventure paths. Uh, so anyway, if Pathfinder is something that interests you, if uh, you're a fan of Chris Avalon, if you like Shane Stacks, uh, or some combination of all those factors, uh, go check it out. I'll post the links to his uh, Shane Plays thing, uh, where you can see what all this is about. All right, I think that'll do it. Uh, I do want to do some Christmas shenanigans, though, uh, before we go to the uh, L segment. So let's just take a look here. I'm going to show you some of the stuff I got for Christmas. Uh, starting with uh, this, this is the chocolate game controller. Uh, this is from Jana and Chris, and it looks like it's a, uh, well, chocolate game controller. <laughs> you know, I don't think this is actually functional, but it looks pretty cool. Uh, so milk chocolate bar. I have no idea where they got this from. I haven't actually torn into this to eat it yet, but I'll let you know uh, what it tastes like. But I was kind of impressed by the uh, the level of detail on this thing. They even have the it's like a little m m different colored m ms for the buttons on that. Uh, so anyway, this looks really cool. Really uh, excited about this. So thank you to Chris and Jana on that one. And then uh, Shane, uh, speak of the devil, uh, sent me a couple things. One is the Rats card game. It's a rowdy rat racing, rat racing riot. Uh, so this is a little card game here. And it looks like it's got some pretty fun cartoon style artwork on it. I haven't got a chance to play this yet, but it uh, does include the Spanish rules, so uh, that's exciting. <laughs> if there's a rat match, be the first to rat slap. It's rat simple. Anyway, <laughs> thank you, Shane. And then he also sent me this uh, book here, simply titled, uh, I don't know if you can see this, but it's called Rats, Observations on the History and Habitat of the City's Most Unwanted... Oh, unwanted? Uh, most unwanted inhabitants. Uh, so it's a whole book. Man, who knew? <laughs> whole book about rats. Love them or loathe them, rats are here to stay. Yes, and they are known to infest cellars. And sometimes you need to hire a whole party of adventurers to go down into the cellar to squash the rats. And then let's see what else. I got a, a little Pac-Man mug here. And you can't see this, but if you pour hot water into this. It actually lights up with the uh, Pac-Man maze. And I'm pretty sure that my wife gave me this. <laughs> I hope so. Uh, if not, apologies for that. Uh, but anyway, it looks a great mug, and, and I've already tried it out, and it works great. But I have to say, I think the coolest thing uh, I got this uh, Christmas was a Sega Genesis Transformer. Uh, so it's a little, it's a little uh, Sega Genesis, looks like the Sega Genesis console. Even has a little cartridge here of a Sonic the Hedgehog, and you can actually open this thing up and transform it into a Megatron. Uh, so it's it's pretty it's just really just amazing. This is from my brother Luke and his uh, new wife Dixie sent me this one. And it, it's <laughs> to be honest with you, it is almost impossible to transform this thing. <laughs> it literally took me about half an hour to get it into this console. Form. So I'm not really eager to, to try to transform it back into a robot. Maybe for the next episode I'll show you that. But uh, anyway, yeah, there's a little bit. You can sort of see how it would transform, right? You can see the Megatron emerging there. <laughs> Is that, oh, man, look at that. Yeah. It's just uh, totally awesome. And 
you know, I never, I didn't even know they were putting things like this out. Now, some people have already asked me this. No, it's not actually, uh, doesn't actually play the games. You can't hook this up to a TV or whatever. Uh, but, but who cares? It's, it's really, really awesome. The level of detail is amazing. So I think they, you know, I'm, re I'm really thankful. <laughs> Thank you uh, to Luke and Dixie for this. Totally awesome gift. Had a lot of fun with it. And uh, maybe I'll transform, figure out how to transform it in the uh, next video. Uh, but anyway, there you go. All right, so what about that ale of the week? All right, so I thought we could start off 2018. How awesome was that? Uh, with this one, this is a Boulevard Brewing Company, which is based in Kansas City, uh, Missouri. M-O. I hope that's Missouri. <laughs> is that Missouri? Oh, man. I'm pretty sure it is. Uh, yeah, Missouri. Woo! Uh, anyway... <laughs> Uh, this is the Rye on Rye on Rye. Rye on Rye on Rye Whiskey Barrel Aged Ale. Limited release, 2017. And uh, let's see what else they say. Did they say anything about it? Oh, we have a whole little paragraph here. How about that? <laughs> Inspired by the success of our X series of special Imperial Stout releases, We've embarked on a journey to the outer reaches of our popular rye on rye. For this inaugural release, a rich, tawny rye ale is aged in first-use Templeton rye whiskey barrels, then transferred to yet another set of first-use Templeton barrels for its second aging, effectively resulting in a rye on rye on rye. It's just kind of fun to say. Try it with me. <laughs> rye on rye on rye. Anyway, this clocks in at 14% alcohol by volume, so definitely on the alcoholic side, 33 IBUs. And it even has a batch number here. It says, uh, best by date, 11 November 2018. So <laughs> well in advance of that. Uh, anyway, I'm a big fan of the Whiskey Barrel Aged Ales. I love that sort of bourbony flavor that you get with those. And I saw this and I thought, you know, you know, <laughs> how can you pass this up? What a great beer for uh, uh, to start off the new year. Anyway, let's get this thing open and see what it's all about. Now, it does have the fancy opening system, so I thought I would uh, try that out and see if I can hit the camera with my cork. Always a lot of fun. Let's see if I can hit you with this. <laughs> you don't want to stare this thing in the... You know, you don't want to be... You, want, you don't want this thing aimed at your face when you're trying to open it. All right, there we go. Let's see if I can do it this time. Don't know why I want to damage my camera, but let's see. Do we have it? Almost. Woo! <laughs> I think I missed that time. Oh, well, maybe next time. Anyway, let's get this thing into, into the uh, drinking horn and see what it's all about. All right, so let's get this poured in. And uh, I do have another bit of news. It just came in uh, David Beatty says that his Mega Wars game is now in the beta phase. It's feature locked, so that's coming along really nicely. Huge fan of that. <clears throat> Big fan of David Beatty in general. A really, really cool dude. Hope that you'll uh, add him as a friend on Facebook and, and stay tuned with that Mega Wars stuff because it's uh, really exciting what they're doing. <sighs> <laughs> Man, alive! You know what? You don't even need to drink this beer. Uh, just buy it and smell it. Uh, that is just the most wonderful aroma. You know, I can honestly say, I've uh, snorted a lot of ales over the years, as you well know if you've watched this channel. And I honestly say... But this, Rye on Rye on Rye by Boulevard Brewing Company is the finest ale I have ever smelled. All right, but anyway, that's just the smell. Uh, of course, the real challenge is the, the taste. Does the flavor live up to the aroma? That is the question we are pondering here at Matt Chat. Anyway, let's go ahead and give it a taste. It's very thick uh, beers. <laughs> oh, 
Oh. Okay, that definitely gets your attention really fast. Very potent uh, concoction that we have here. Um, you pretty much toast, you, you kind of have this toasty marshmallow-like flavor. Uh, a little bit of that bourbon, sort of cherry aroma kicking in there, or, uh, flavor kicking in there at the end. Uh, you know, I wonder, can you get drunk just by the, f the fumes of ale? You know, I kind of wonder that. I, I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, I'm already starting to kind of feel a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, uh, buzzed here. Anyway, let me give it another taste. Oh man, this is really, really strong brew. Uh, you definitely get a lot of that uh, sweet, sort of syrupy, a lot of cherry, uh, chocolatey flavor. It's kind of like a real bitter coffee-like flavor. And if you know those little uh, sort of cocoa-dusted uh, truffles, if you ever had those, kind of bitter chocolate, cacao, or whatever they call that stuff. Actually, you, you taste that, uh, a lot of that sweetness, uh, but really you're kind of bowled over by the strength of this. I mean, this is... <laughs> Definitely a sipping brew. I mean, I would hate to think if somebody tried to chug this thing, they'd probably die. I'll try it one more time. Ugh. Yeah, so with this one, uh, I think it tastes, I mean, it smells amazing. Uh, the taste is good. It's just a really, really strong. Uh, you definitely need to have a... <laughs> <laughs> you know, a full stomach when you drink this. Be careful with it. You know, four, they, they say it's 14%. You know, I, I swear it's more like a 20%. I mean, it's just super, super strong uh, tasting. You really, the, the alcohol kind of bowls you over. Uh, you definitely get a lot of that bourbony flavor, the rye on rye on rye, all that sort of uh, spot on. Uh, so if you want a really strong brew, if you like that rye uh, whiskey flavor, I'd say go for this. So I'm going to go ahead and go a full five out of five drinking horns on it. With a caveat, uh, if, if, you, if you don't like whiskey, of course, stay away. Uh, if you like a weaker brew, uh, stay away. Uh, but if you want something that'll put some hair on your chest and really get your attention and something that you could just kind of slowly sip on for like hours, uh, I think this would really fit the bill. So I'm going to go five out of five on the Boulevard Rye on Rye on Rye. <laughs> Limited release, so you better get it while, while it's available. Uh, but anyway, really, really tasty, but really, really strong. So be careful. All right, so let's wrap this up with a quotation. And I was looking uh, for quotations about challenges, and there's, there's quite a few to choose from, uh, but I really like this one from Sylvester Stallone. <laughs> uh, and it, it just sounds like something he would totally say. But anyway, it goes something like this. I'm always looking for a new challenge. There are a lot of mountains to climb out there. When I run out of mountains, I'll build a new one. <laughs> That's just so perfect. Uh, anyway, I uh, hope you guys enjoyed that, and see you next time. Excuse me, when did the Mongols rule China? I don't know, I just work here. <laughs>